Good afternoon. We'd like, we'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the study session for May City Council for Monday, April 15, 2013. I believe that uh, Council Members Glover, Hit, um, Glover, Summers, and Higgins will not be with us for the uh, study session. I, I don't know who's going to be here. I know Summers is going to be gone for the regular Council meeting, but at least those three, so there will be four of us. Uh, the first item on the agenda is to review tonight's uh, regular council meeting agenda. Page two, items two through three D. Items four A through four C. Items four D through four F. Mr. Brady? Mayor. Nope. Which is the one? Which one? Q? H. Oh, uh, sorry. I jumped ahead. I wasn't there yet. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was on the F. Okay. We're going to pull 4H when you get to it, Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Richens <laughs> talked about 4H, and I go, what, is, this, is this another Lehigh farm animal thing? Oh. I mean, I was thinking 4F, and I got the farm with that and not the 4H part, so I messed up. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> you, you're <laughs> <laughs> You're too young to have a draft number. And, uh, and to... Items 4G through 4H. Councilmember Richens or Mr. Brady, who's going to take well, it? Well, I just, you know, I, we've, we've spent, I don't know, $20, 25000000 million in the five years I've been here on IT technology, which was sorely needed. We were really behind. I, I'm just trying to learn more about what this does. Um, I don't have a good understanding, so it's a big number. I want to make sure that uh, we're all up to speed. I've had a few other council members and some constituents asking questions about it as well. So um, just a pause, push the pause button on this one just a little bit until we uh, get up to speed. I, I'm, not a, I'm not an IT expert. Nope. Right? <laughs> so, good. Thanks. Okay, so we are uh, continuing this. Let's just take, remove it, Mayor, and then remove we'll it. come back at another time. Okay. I don't want to just say. Yeah, don't continue. Let's remove it. I think there were some questions that we just need time to have those answered. 4-H is removed from the agenda. Items 4-I and 4-J. <laughs> you know how young everyone is when they don't know what a 4-F is in the draft. Even Brady's going, I have no idea what he's talking about. I volunteered. Dennis and I are the only two that I think fully yeah, I understand. I volunteered that, that my actually registration. had draft numbers. That actually had draft numbers and were probably eligible for 4-F because of the, no, <laughs> physical specimens we were. That's right. <laughs> 4K, 4K through 5C. 4K through 5C. 6, uh, no, 5D through 5K. 5L through 7B. and 8A through 9A, and I'm going to, uh, I don't know if everyone's gonna be here tonight. I think this is too important of an issue to uh, take up when we don't have a full council, considering that there are disagreements on the council. So I'm going to continue this, or ask that we continue this to next meeting, 9A, yeah. That being said, we do have the developers and Marriott here, both parties. And so I would like to, if we could, since they are here, and I know they made some travel change problems, I know there are questions in this, even though not everyone's here, this might be a good time to maybe clear up some things or have them explain some things, so. Mr. Rigby, you want to introduce your, your two guests here? Absolutely, Mayor. Thank you. Um, Scott Rigby with the City of Seacon Development Office. I have Scott McAllister from Marriott Corporate, and then I also have uh, Paul Walker with Sunrise uh, Properties. Scott's with the Corporate Office and happy to answer about uh, how, they, how they run their business. Uh, Scott, if you could, I mean, because I think there's some, uh, th this, is, this is not the normal development process we have here. Usually, we have a developer that shows up with a proposal, 
uh, we deal with the developer, it's the developer's idea, it's the, and that's the normal thing, whether it be an office building or whatever. And I found out through this process that, uh, especially as we're, as we're dealing with, uh, with these types of properties, it's a very different process. We deal primarily with the corporate first, and then uh, the developer becomes sort of a partner, as, and I don't know the exact relationship you have with that, but maybe if you could explain to us a little bit about how at least, certainly at least Marriott uh, looks at property and how they decide how to move on and how you get people like uh, Mr. Welker involved in, in this process. If you could just spend a couple minutes. Absolutely, thank you. We Marriott have nearly 4,000 hotels worldwide. So we're a global organization. We've been doing this business for over 80 years. We have a very specific model that we follow in developing hotels, whether that be in the United States or elsewhere. Uh, we have uh, over 18 brands that we represent. Many people don't recognize that, you know, they say Marriott is, is Marriott, but we have lots of, you know, residents in or Courtyard or Spring Hill Suites. And so uh, we, we have a very, um, very specific model that we follow as we go through to develop new hotels. We will go into a market that we have interest in and we will look to see which ho which markets or which areas specifically make sense to put a hotel in. Sometimes we will look at a market and say that one's not for us. We will turn markets away because it doesn't make sense, but when there are demand generators, when there's business to be had, we look at that from Marriott's perspective and say there is an opportunity for us to develop a hotel there that will be successful, that will be profitable, and that will be a great asset not only to the city, to the owners, to, and to Marriott. It will be able to build our brands. And so that's really what we go in and we look for. Uh, I had the great opportunity of meeting with um, uh, Mr. Rock Arnett, and he introduced me actually to uh, the city. I came and met uh, with, with uh, Chris Brady and we had some conversations about a couple of different development opportunities, but especially the conversation turned to uh, Wrigleyville. We, we Marriott have had an opportunity to look at di many different opportunities in Mesa. Uh, we had an opportunity back five or six years ago to look at uh, where the Hyatt Place is currently located, and, and, and we were a little bit concerned at that point. Wrigleyville is a game changer. Wrigleyville is a great location with great amenities. It's at the freeway intersections. Uh, there's the Paseo and all the demand generators that are going to be there, the amenities that are going to be there. Those are the types of things that we look for when we are developing a hotel. We want to know that the hotels are going to be full, who are those demand generators? And we also want to know what the amenities are, what, what area or what things are in the area that the people, the guests will want to do once they've finished their day's work from you know, nine to five. And so when we look at Wrigleyville, we say that that is a great opportunity. The demand generators are there, the amenities are there in the market with, with Wrigleyville itself, with the Paseo, et cetera. And we look at the location being easy access to the 101, the 202 freeways, easy access to Boeing and some of the other major accounts. So that for us is a great opportunity that we merit strongly support. We merit though, we don't own anything. We don't buy anything. I'm not the person who's going to come in and buy any land. I'm not going to own any hotels. And so what happens is we look at who might the, uh, who, what ownership groups are available that might be interested in developing a hotel. And so after I had a meeting with the city manager and, and understanding a little bit more about what this project entailed, we, uh, I sat down and evaluated several different development companies. One of my thoughts turned to Sunridge, which is owned by Paul and Brian Welker. In December, they were just recognized and awarded Marriott's Partnership Award from Mr. Marriott. We, Marriott, have 12 or 14 hotels that, that Sunridge Hospitality has developed over the past uh, probably eight or ten years all throughout Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, southern Arizona, different states around this area that they have done an outstanding job in developing the hotel and operating the hotel. And so I went to the Welkers and said we have an opportunity to look at developing a hotel in Mesa. And we had that conversation and so then the conversation turns to what brand do we choose? Well, every brand has a different segment that we, we try to go after. We, 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 if it's an extended stay type of brand, if it's a short term, depends on what the price point is that people are willing to pay. And the brand that absolutely makes the most sense for this site is Spring Hill Suites. And let me give you two reasons why that is. First of all, every room is a suite versus 
some of your other types of hotels where they're regular rooms. When you have leisure travelers that are coming, which would certainly be the case for Wrigleyville, because of not only Wrigleyville itself, but the baseball fields, the softball fields, the soccer fields, there are going to be lots of tournaments. You're going to have sports teams, you're going to have families, etc. So every room is a suite, and they, those families, those sports teams, everybody appreciates the extra space in a Spring Hill Suites. The second reason why Spring Hill Suites makes sense is that it has free breakfast. When you're bringing a family of four or five people, free breakfast makes all the sense in the world for those families. Otherwise, if you're, you're paying $10, $12 per person for breakfast. So having the suite, having free breakfast, and having the new decor, the modern look, and uh, the modern feel of the hotel, absolutely Spring Hill Suites is the right brand to put in, uh, in Wrigleyville. We looked at all the other brands. We said, would a, would a residence inn work or would a courtyard work? They don't work at nearly as well as a Spring Hill Suites. And what is kind of the, the bottom line to determining that? It's really about what makes the most economic sense. What hotel is going to make the most money for not only the ownership group, but also for Marriott, but also for the city? I mean, there's going to be, you know, TOT tax, obviously, that comes back. And so we all want the same thing. We all want to be able to make the most amount of money at the end of the day. And Spring Hill Suites is that brand. It's, it's the brand based on higher occupancy and also based on a strong average rate that we'd be able to collect. Councilman Richens. Having, <clears throat> having stated a few different configurations of Spring Hill Suites, how do you, come to, how do you decide what amenities you're gonna include? Because I've seen several different uh, amenity packages in Spring Hill Suites. So how mm -hmm. do you come to that conclusion? We have a list of standards uh, that we include that are uh, part of what the Spring Hill Suites brand is about. Most of those standards are, I'm going to say, optional. There are certain things that are required. There are certain things that are optional. But really what we want is to make a market-based decision. What makes the most sense for that market? So, for example, if we were to offer... Um, Let's just talk about a bar, for example. That is an option. Merit does not mandate it. Merit does not say that it has to, that it, you don't have to do one. But we look at it and we say, what exactly, uh, it, or where does it make sense? We have over 300 Spring Hill Suites. Less than 10% of them actually have a bar because it's an individual market-driven decision. And the economics of putting a bar in a hotel like a Spring Hill Suites does not make sense. If you're a full service hotel, if you're a Marriott, or if you're a Hilton, or if you're a Hyatt, it makes sense to put a bar in. But the economics don't make sense when you're a limited service hotel. The, the entire premise of making money at a limited service hotel is staffing. And so to staff a bar when you're gonna have two or three people come through to get a drink doesn't make sense. So that is something that is one of our options. It's not mandated. It's not uh, something that you know they don't have to do either. So, so if you think the amenity can make money, you're going to do it? Correct. Generally speaking, yes. I mean, if, if we can make money as a business, then we want to be able to do it. Let me give you another example. We have what we call marketplaces in the hotel. We can fill it up with ice cream, salads, frozen pizzas, burritos, whatever. We keep track of what it is that people are buying from the market. If people aren't buying frozen burritos, we're not going to put frozen burritos in the market. Right? We want to put things that are in there that are going to make the most amount of money. And we want, the, you know, I mean, if, if somebody wants to have uh, lean cuisine, we're going to put lean cuisine in the market all day long. If, if, if Haagen-Dazs ice cream goes like wild, then we're going to put Haagen-Dazs ice cream in the market. So whatever the people want is what we will put in the market so that we're providing a service for them and we're also able to make money. But let me just also add, if I may, that we just completed our... Um, a, a focus group, study group, where we went out and interviewed over a thousand people and said, what is it that you want in our hotels? So I, I think that we come with, you know, pretty good expertise or we've interviewed a lot of people and asked the question. And what they want is they want flexibility and they want something that is healthy for them. Healthy for them in California is different than healthy for them is in New York and different than what healthy is in Chicago. All three of those places have different healthy codes, and not codes, but requirements, people, what people want or what people like. And so we're, we, Marriott, are not going to dictate and said everybody has to have this in their marketplace. It's whatever sells, whatever works, whatever makes money, whatever your guests want. Yeah, it, so if, if I'm hearing that, you have 10% that do. It's not 
precluded if you got in there, and I guess this would be to Mr. Welker, um, and you found that maybe the market decided they wanted something besides that, then what's the process you go through deciding whether you're going to, you're going to add that? That's not a long process. I mean, we can adapt to that uh, quite quickly, and that's part of the flexibility that Scott talks about. Um, you know, whatever is market driven, whatever at the end of the day we can make money at and is feasible, you know, we're more than open to do that. It's just a market economic decision. Let me add, too, that the roughly 10% of the Spring Hill suites that do have bars, their location is such that they're way out. I'm going to say in the middle of nowhere. They don't have restaurants nearby that you can walk to. They don't have any other amenities. So they kind of have a captive audience. With the great vision of Wrigleyville and with the Paseo, with the restaurants and, the, and with the uh, you know, bars that will be coming in there, it makes absolute sense that our guests would be able to have a better quality food experience, dining experience, et cetera, by going to one of those uh, locations than by trying to staff a bar that simply is going to have one or two people come through on a daily basis. The economic doesn't work and there are better options up and down along the Paseo. Is that, a, I mean, knowing just a little bit, once you start serving like alcohol, it, it would seem like that's another big insurance and all that kind of stuff. So is that a fairly, that would seem like a fairly big decision. It, it is on a, on an upper mid scale <laughs> type property, like we're talking about, that is a significant, uh, you know, dram shop insurance, all of the, the uh, factors that go with that type of thing, uh, staffing, cost of goods, insurance, all of those things play into the occasion with uh, the situation, which has to be analyzed. Let me ask you something. Up here on the on the board, uh, you have a conceptual first rendering. I, I know that, uh, and I don't know what the other council members were, but uh, we, I was pretty, I'm very, very uh, sensitive to uh, uh, to what goes in there because I, I've seen some Spring Hill Suites. I've stayed in some, love them. Uh, there's no doubt there's some that are bland suburban style, and then I've st actually stayed in an urban style, which was really nice from the outside. Um, you know, we're investing a lot of money. Uh, literally a few yards away from where you're going to build this, and we're we're building it to certain architectural standards. Um, what what have you? I know we've talked to you a great deal about upgrading uh, the the architectural standards on this. Can, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing and how this might differ? How you might think that uh, uh, this is this is a higher quality uh, architecturally than than other. Yes, this is uh, what you see up there is not a standard prototypical uh, suburban hotel, and we've adapted. We've with all those items in mind, we've adapted this to fit into the environment, the the Wrigleyville, if you will. Uh, instead of a straight building, we've created an L shape uh, that has you know higher roof lines. Uh, it's got steel structures on it, balconies, uh, brick, stone. Uh, the you know the extra cost here is going to be significant to produce this type of product that's that's not typical. And did you volunteer this, or did the city sort of gently suggest you do this? Uh, this is in order to be you know qualified in, in discussions with Marriott and with the city. It's been suggested that we follow the. the that was pattern. a gentle suggestion, right? Yeah. <laughs> I want to make sure that was gently suggested. Yeah, and so we've had our architectural teams working to come up with this, which is out of the norm. It's it's there's significant cost involved in doing this over and above. Uh, but we feel like, you know, Wrigleyville is a good project. We want to be able to take advantage of that with the right product in the right place. And the extra cost is something that we're going to absorb in order to be able to do that. Okay. Councilman Kevin. <clears throat> Thank you. We've had lots of discussions on this issue. And I appreciate the improvement in design. It has really uh, moved along very well. We've also talked about the issue of the amenity package in hotels. And there are limited service hotels, such as Hilton Garden Inn, Hyatt Place, that have bars in them. They're not staffed all the time. They're staffed on an as-needed basis by hotel staff that are cross-trained to deliver product when people are there. And so um, I don't think it's a foreign concept to, uh, to have a bar in as part of the amenity package when the hotel opens here. And you know the reasons I've said this is that uh, what does it look like opening a hotel in a sports and entertainment district that is dry? And your hotel is, is going to be a, a great pace setter and will be the only structure there for a period of time. 
that is open for people to utilize. And so, again, one of the one of the things in the amenity package, again, I I know I and many others on the council want you to consider is, is having this to be part of it. The there are people, believe it or not, who don't like to go to sports bars or other places like that. They want to come for the the baseball experience, and mom and pop may want to have a beer or a glass of wine. Don't want to leave the hotel, or you can have business travelers who've traveled all day again who don't want to leave the hotel, where the normal expectation is in a hotel of this quality and caliber is is to be able to 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 buy that uh, that glass of wine or or a bottle of beer. And so, again, that's kind of that's again where I'm coming from. I'm looking at the context of where this hotel will be, ultimately part of a great entertainment district with lots of places for people to experience both along the Paseo and in, in nearby Riverview. So again, uh, this is something that uh, I hope that that uh, that we can come to some consensus on at some point uh, for the for terms in, in the MOU. And I just wanted, again, to express publicly, this is where I'm coming from, and I know uh, many other members of the council, I think, share that view. Vice Mayor. Let's throw on my two cents. Appreciate you being here. I've been excited from the beginning about the prospects. You know, we're going through this very public process, what you do when you're dealing with city property and other things. Uh, as an observer, I would say from where we started, our first announcement, the information getting out to now, I think we're in a better place. Things have improved. The mayor alluded to that, that uh, quality design materials you know this is a negotiation as we're working towards that mou so um, <clears throat> although it might be difficult for some I'm, I'm thinking that hey we're moving along in a good direction so uh, i'm just hoping you know these last few steps as we get to that point there might be some opportunities uh, but I'm, I'm still really excited and and what this means for that area so thank you thank you um can, can i make a response to councilman kavanaugh uh, yes, Hilton Garden Inn, Hyatt Place, they do have bars. We have hotels that have bars. This is an economic decision. If you were to go talk to those Hilton Garden Inns and Hyatt Place hotels that are, you know, running 50 to 60 percent occupancy and ask them, <clears throat> how much money are you making in your bar, the, the, it is not a profit center. So this is an economic decision. We give, Marriott gives, every one of our 300 Spring Hill Suites the choice do you want to put a bar in or not? It does not make economic sense to put a bar in. And, and that's our position. Well, so I don't well uh, let's, let's put that. If it doesn't, doesn't make an eco economic sense, I would assume, not an econ major, but that means that not enough people are buying that is correct. alcohol to, uh, to pay the bills. And, and that is correct. And if there are, if there is large request or if it's in an area that, you know, for, for whatever reason they feel like it's necessary and people are asking for it, then adjustments can be made to that model. And they put Absolutely. in a bar. Yeah. They, they, yeah, they serve. Correct. So, so they're driven by what their customers want. They're driven by what their customers want, and at least up front, they say our customers don't want it. It doesn't make economic sense to have a, a bar with all the insurance, the labor, the licenses, and all those things. Doesn't make sense up front, and so as a result, they say no. If somebody asks the question, if it keeps coming back again and again <coughs> and again, then we make adjustments to the business model. Councilman Kavanaugh. Okay, and then again, my response is. Do you have a Spring Hill Suites that's next to a baseball stadium? Uh, we Are there a sports arena. We do. We have know? a hotel next to Bank One Ballpark within walking distance, and uh, it. Uh, we don't have a bar in that one. If we had the demand, we would consider it. Um, we also have one fairly close in downtown Salt Lake City. Uh, that doesn't and uh, so we're in some venues where we have sports facilities you know adjacent uh, we have one in downtown Denver that just opened uh, a year ago next to the I think it's the Pepsi Center where they play uh, where the Denver Nuggets play mm -hmm. there's no bar in that hotel and again these are economic decisions and what uh, Scott indicated was that uh, you know the majority of those lose money uh, that you're gonna end up subsidizing them and you have to look at what the overall room rate is uh, if that will if that will support that type of activity yeah. and again as a follow-up you have a hybrid where you're able to sell the uh, the beer or wine out of your marketplace that there is that that is available thank you 
And once again, though, if you, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out if, if you can't make money at it, why would you do it? Right. And that's that's the whole question. You know, what is the economic feasibility? The other point, too, is one of the reasons that we're going into Wrigleyville, or at least we're make you know, we're, we're talking about it today, is because there will be future things there where there will be other venues, bars and restaurants, because that will complete the package for us. I mean, if I, we thought we were going to be the only thing there, it would lessen our interest to a large degree. And when those venues come in, we found that, and I think Scott will agree, in our personal experience, people would rather go somewhere else if it's within walking distance and not use the hotel facilities. They will leave the hotel, particularly if they don't have to drive, and they'll seek other places. So if we ended up putting in you know, a large capital structure to accommodate these things and Wrigleyville develops as we anticipate and you know, feel, feel pretty certain that it will, we're going to be competing against additional competitors that you know we just can't you know hotels guests don't prefer on site which is always interesting me about the breakfast and and you, you know everyone it seems like you want to stay close for breakfast but those same people must not want to come back for dinner or else you'd have a dinner service too right yeah they they want to socialize they want to get out they've had a long day's work or activity with the kids whatever the situation might be they're going to go somewhere else but it but makes breakfast, sense they want to stay up there for breakfast uh, you're not the only one that offers free breakfast pretty much everybody does right. that now yeah. because it's market driven you know you figure that in you build the rate structure so that you can accommodate that and uh you know it's an economic factor councilman richens uh, I've never been much of one to micromanage what somebody does inside their private business, but I want to ask you a question. Um, how adaptable is your lobby if you find the market condition changes and you think that, that you could make money doing that? How adaptable is your lobby to, I mean, would... Yeah, the lobby doesn't change, the footprint doesn't change whether you have it or not. You just, you know, build that into the space. So it's the same footprint. So, so you, you found would just, your customers were had a, you had a market demand for it. You could respond to it right. pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> it stays the same. And just to clarify, there's no Puritan filter that we're putting this through, right? You know, I I I, I thought I heard it. You know, from the public, uh, well, that's Mesa. We don't want to put a bar in or something. That has nothing to do with this process. These are market-driven decisions. And right. So you're saying you're, you're a crass capitalist then? Yeah. <laughs> that's all it's about. Well, we don't it's want to call it exactly religious that. look. There's nothing along those lines. So he, thank he had, you. We don't want he, to. Go he belongs broke. to the green religion. <laughs> yeah, and Scott indicated there's only 10 percent of yeah. all all these hotels that have done it. So you know. Yeah. So, so specifically, then I'm, I, the next jump up would be more of a full service. But you know, once again, because this is by baseball, th those t those types of hotels tend to be in commercial centers. Yeah, thank you. More of a business traveler type of thing. A full service hotel is, uh, you know, it's much larger. The construction cost is nearly double, and there is nearly three times as much labor. If I was to question the council here, you know, what was the last full service hotel that was built? we would have to go back and think a long time ago because the economic model for a full service hotel does not work today for a new building. Can you even finance those? You cannot. No, and that's why there haven't been any, is, is that no lenders are willing to to loan that kind of money on such a big yeah. project with we, such we a low return. We, we found that out <laughs> firsthand. Case in point, I mentioned we have a hotel in downtown Phoenix, and uh, they just built the Sheraton. I think that was the last full service hotel built in the Phoenix area. And that was a public uh, city of Phoenix. City of Phoenix, because they couldn't get any, they couldn't get anyone private. Right, they tried and tried for years and years, and that's in downtown Phoenix, uh, which is a pretty good core, and we have a great familiarity with. And they finally, the city financed it, guaranteed the bonds. And uh, if you guys would like to do that, we'd be happy to <laughs> talk to you about doing okay. that. Okay. Um, any other questions? Moving on. <laughs> Notice I cut you off on that. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. That was not that was not by well, accident. Yeah. Paul, yeah. Um, any other questions? Well, listen, I, and I'm I'm sorry that, that I know there's at least two other. Uh, I don't know what Councilor Summers. I, I wish they would have been here. I think this would have been instructive for them. But I'm sure there'll be some additional questions. Uh, I appreciate your willingness to uh, come in and cut a check. I mean, I I tend to agree with uh, Councilmember Richens. I I want to make a decision based on trust not trusting but understanding that you guys have a model uh, marriott is the brand that i personally want to see in that uh, in that area i think it's it is it is by far um the superior brand for that location i think it gives us the best chance operating uh 
I, I've, I know just enough, enough about, about hotels to be really dangerous. I'm assuming that with all the experience Marriott has, they know a little bit more about hotels and investments. And I know that Mr. Welker, uh, with all the millions of dollars you've personally invested in, in hotels, or maybe you do it all with other people's money. I don't know. Uh, the fact is, is that, um, you know, we're partners in this because we own the land. We're partners in this because we've, we've developed, uh, we're the master developer, so to speak. Uh, and so we're going to look at things uh, uh, that make sure that we uh, that, that we have a say. At the end of the day, we want this to be a success. And I'm, I'm with Council Regions that I don't know that I want to go in and tell you what color you make your rooms or how you check people in. I, I, I'm going to trust that Marriott knows that a little bit better than I do. And I appreciate your willingness to make a substantial investment. And I know that's not cheap, uh, having built uh, uh, some things uh, to add the balconies and do the... Uh, you know, that roof wasn't a flat roof. You know, it was a, I saw a multi-level roof. Those are not cheap, inexpensive things, and I appreciate that because I, whatever, I believe in, correct me, I, whatever deal you're getting on the land, I would assume we're taking that money right back in design or coming pretty close to it. Yeah, it would uh, significantly exceed any differential in that, that uh, formula, yeah. Mayor. Uh, based on what the design. Yeah, any any time you put angles or deviations or whatever, the cost goes way up. I I can tell you from specific experience that that's the case. So. Well, I can tell you too that the, for the prototype Spring Hill Suites, compared to the visuals yeah. that we saw up on the boards, uh, I mean there is a significant increase in cost in what they are building than what we would be doing in most any other market. So they are spending a, a lot more money to okay. to really match this to Wrigleyville. Well, thank you, and I and I, I you know. Mr. Rigby, although there's nothing guaranteed, I, I, I was uh, I was encouraged by the response that I know we got, and also the Cubs told us they got after the announcement was made. Uh, several serious inquiries. I, I think that the restaurants are going to happen a lot sooner than later. It, it appears that there's a lot of interest, and driven by the fact that Marriott was going in there. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I, I hope we don't get down to a build a hotel only because it serves alcohol versus no hotel. Because I don't think we're going to, you know, I, I think, I don't know that we're going to do better. And I, I share the vice mayor's excitement than having a Marriott there with that kind of investment and that kind of design. Uh, and, you know, Spring Hill Suite is a nice brand uh, that does a good job. Well, thank you. We hope it doesn't get down to that, too. We believe in this project in Wrigleyville, or I would not be sitting here. And if thank it you. got down to a point where it's, you know, whether you can or cannot serve alcohol would be counterproductive and yeah. does not make economic sense. Well, and I, once again, I, I, I used to, one of the reasons I ran is I, I used to chastise city councils that micromanaged uh, <laughs> per, private investments. And while we are a little partner, it's significant, we're not cutting the multi-million dollar check the year. I don't know what you're going to yeah. spend, 10 million or whatever it's going to cost to build this. We're not mm -hmm. cutting that check and we know you, you want to be successful too. And Mayor, might I add, and, and uh, kind of echoing what has been said tonight, we, we lean heavily on what Marriott, uh, you know, asks us to do and what they recommend. And we had a long and lengthy discussions about what would be the best brand here, what fits the market, and, and uh, we rely heavily on them and their experience. Okay. With 4,000 hotels and umpteen thousand of rooms in the world, we found out that their decisions, usually, whether it's color, the wallpaper, or bedding, or whatever, don't go out on a limb. They've got it figured out. Don't recreate the will there. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you, you Mayor and Council. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is um, here presentation discuss status of the fiscal year 13 14 City of Mesa budget. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, today, what we'd like to do is today we are kicking off the bud the uh, department budget presentations to Council. We want to start with a budget update on where we are so far. The last time we talked with you about the budget, we mentioned that we did have an estimated eight to nine million dollars shortfall, budget shortfall for the 13-14 fiscal year. Um, at that point, we told you we would continue to look at some options that we thought we might have available, some savings that we could look into. Um, at this point, we've identified a few savings here. The first one is we told you we would be looking into the Employee Benefit Trust Fund. 
This is the fund that our medical claims, both medical and dental, as well as life insurance and so forth for our employees, are in a trust fund. Each year, the city contributes a significant amount of money to that trust fund, as well as employee portions as well. We looked at that and we looked at how we finished our 11-12 fiscal year and we saw that we did finish our 11-12 fiscal year with a healthy trust fund balance. <coughs> it appears that the cost containment measures that we put in a year and two years ago have really come to fruition. When we originally put the cost containment measures in, we were hoping that they would um, actually have re some result in some savings and we are pleasantly surprised that they are indeed doing that. And now that we have seen a trend in that area, we feel that going into the 13-14 fiscal year, we could decrease the city's contribution by about $3.5 million. So I want to make clear, because when I first read that, the way it's worded is that we are unilaterally making that. What you're saying is the required contribution that is, correct. is lower. Right? That is correct. So this is, this is not a judgment that we're going to underfund. No. The, uh, well, I mean, if you read that, you could get the impression that we're not underfunding. What we're saying is that we budgeted X amount, and we're finding out that all these efforts that we have will require us to put in three and a half million dollars less than we had anticipated so it's <clears> it's, <throat> it's 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 a, an opportunity uh to uh, because we've, we've been successful in the savings is that correct that's correct mayor councilman richens okay so get down to what matters how does it affect what a employee pays and what the city pays in, at, in a, a month to month at this point right now we'll be working over this summer with our benefit uh, group and with our consultant as well. We have a consultant that comes in and works, helps us to work on our rates. We're not setting rates at this time. Get to it. But, but, but <laughs> That's a lot of work. Kansas, don't get right. it. Is it Just more for the employee no. or less? No, no, no. Employee. So what we've done is the come split come is usually 80-20. Correct. Okay. Wow. City, city typically picked plan. up 80% right. of the full cost. That's okay. staying. And so like. what we're looking at is as we go into the next year, and one of the things we we're having to be sensitive to is that we're going to keep we're going to reduce what the city contributes on behalf into the trust fund okay the employees rate will remain the same okay. going forward okay. okay and so we do that and we're also having to look at I think if you go talk to and it's been well publicized all over the media everybody is really trying to figure out what's going to happen really the next three to five years is going to be very significant in the health care uh, benefits just because of all the changes at the federal level we're going to have new taxes on every employee in the city. We're going to have a variety of different things. So, so we're trying to only take enough that reserves enough so that we can anticipate. What we don't want to do is reduce the, the trust fund, then realize next year we have to have a 10 or 12 percent rate increase right. for either the city or the employees. Right. So in, in short, you know, we may be paying $800 per employee, but because we think we can reduce what we put in, it might be $775 per employee. Right. But it's still an 80-20 split. Do you figure on an annual basis, the total collections, what, is it over, how much is it, 50 plus million? The entire employee benefit trust fund expenses are about $62 million $62 a year. $62 million. Dollars. So when we make this adjustment, it actually is, in the totality, Right. it's insignificant. But we have to make sure we have that cushion because $3.5 million looks like is a lot of money. But in a claims world, and we've had claims from employees, mm -hmm. we could eat that up in a year, in a half year, very quickly. So we are very conservative because we don't want to be caught short at any time in the trust fund. But we did feel, based upon what we saw last year and the trend last year as far as the revenues that went in, the expenses that were hitting the trust fund, because of a lot of the cost containment initiatives we put in place, the out-of-network limitations mm -hmm. and all those, that really we did see that um, result and so we feel like just from that alone we can make this reduction every year we'll assess this what we're concerned about is what we're hearing from the industry and our consultants is the next two or three years we could see significant increases and so we will try to absorb some of that in the fund balance but inevitably we're going to continue to pass along more increases to the employees and the city in the future okay but for this year People should not anticipate paying more for their health insurance, at least for this. The employees will continue to see a Based slight increase. This, employees will see a slight increase. The one that we've right. scheduled and talked the about. The one we scheduled about. We're not changing that schedule. Right. What we're doing is changing the city. The city's contribution is where we're seeing the largest impact into the trust fund. Okay. And so we can do this in, in lieu of other cost-cutting measures that could affect yes. employees. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That's correct. So basically we're adjusting the reserve based on experience. And remembering that, that this is a budget amount, 
uh, you know, I, I think we forget the fact that what we're talking about are, are deviations from budget. Uh, and budget doesn't always uh, match uh, what we actually spend, but we budgeted this amount, we looked at our experience, and we believe that a combination of reserve analysis and savings analysis, we could reduce the amount that we, that we put in. That's correct. Okay. Based on what, what we were budgeting to put in. Correct. Based on the okay. forecast that we had devised before. Right. Okay. okay. Another yes. area that we've looked at is also our municipal water rate. Um, we're looking at our municipal water right now, and we are do not have a city of Mesa water rate on schedule like we do for our electric. So we're looking at this point to see if we can reduce that wa the rate we're paying right now to ourselves. So today we have a municipal electric users rate. Oh, okay. Right. That we we approve interdepartmental. Correct. What? Well, Intra yes. city interdepartmental. Correct. And so as we are looking at ways to reduce costs, specifically you can imagine a large water user like this would be the Parks Department. So they pay a significant amount of revenue. So what we've said is, you know, we really should consider, just as we did for facilities and electric use, we created a municipal water, or sorry, municipal electric rate, mm -hmm. is that we've, we're proposing a municipal water rate specifically uh, target to parks and recreation. So that will uh, help save costs to parks and recreation. Uh, at the same time, by reducing the rate, the current rate they're paying, it'll also reduce the revenues into the water and wastewater department. And I know we look at these as enterprise versus departmental, but in the scheme of things, this is city of Mesa to city of Mesa. Yes. That's correct. So really what you're doing is that you're doing general fund, you're saving money in the general fund. Uh, by reducing the by rates reducing from the, the enterprise rate fund. From the enterprise fund. That's correct. correct. Okay. All right. Okay. So at the end of the day, this doesn't. This helps our general fund, but yeah, it's it, it again. We use it's that. A, it's we, an accounting measure. We did that for electric, and so we yes. thought okay. that we we should do that for water. All right. Okay. Yeah. Let's don't don't give her don't give her any eye contact. <laughs> okay. Next and item. The, the next item then are in uh, in building fees, uh, building mm -hmm. permits, and other things that are going to come in because of more homes being built. That's correct. correct. That's the increase in the new home construction activity. As we started looking at the beginning when we did the forecast in February, we did see an increase in some home sales and some construction activity and sales tax related to that. At that time, we were really waiting to see if this was a trend or just a bubble. So this is above and beyond what we have in the forecast. Gotcha. That's correct. Okay. So at this point, we think it, we can, at this point, raise it up a little bit based on what we're seeing as a trend. Okay, and then I get the, uh, the refunding savings. We're, we're finding money. We're considering now this probably be the last of that mm -hmm. because the markets have moved on us quite a bit. Okay. So. But I think we did pretty good in the first few we, No, no, in the last three years, years we've done we've significant. Done but this was a timing So issue. this gets you to $5.8 million. Right. That's correct. That gets us to $5.8 million. If you recall, the shortfall was, was 8 to 9. So we're not quite there on what we've found so far. We do have some other identified. But we're almost two thirds of the way there. We're almost there. Well, and that only includes the shortfall in the forecast. It doesn't include, and you'll you'll see from the department's okay. other requests that are above and beyond what was in the forecast. So we'll have a variety of different requests that we'll have to balance out with um, okay. meeting. This is the shortfall. starting point. Yeah. Exactly. Correct. This is the starting. It also point. doesn't, if you recall, the forecast does not include any compensation issues for employees either when we did the original forecast. So that eight to nine million dollars is just to cover the current level of service as it sits today. I mean, we like to, we like to think of from a prior perspective. You have the shortfall, but then right after that, you have the ability. What we're, what are we going to do to tr maybe tr try to address employee compensation at the same time? Gotcha. Okay, Vice Mayor. <clears throat> Having one of those moments, do I not say anything? Uh, so I have a suggestion for the future. Since okay. it wasn't that long ago that we announced this eight to nine million dollar, why don't we do this? prior to taking a hit in the in the paper saying there were eight to nine million dollars short and then next time we can say hey we're just a couple million dollars short this was a wonderful exercise I'd, I'd heard some of this mentioned a while back and so I appreciate all the good work that's being done but maybe in the future instead of you know kind of giving everybody the impression we're scratching along is hey here's two-thirds of that already gone in a heartbeat I call it the rabbit out of the hat and I use that pretty regularly every year. We pull a rabbit out of the hat. How many rabbits do you have? Uh, anyway? Interesting. Another rabbit out of the hat. And just a matter of a few weeks ago, we had an eight to nine million dollars loss. So I'm being a little smart aleck on it, as my mother would say. So anyway. Councilor well, Richens? I mean, but isn't this a decision yet to be made? Because if, if the eight to nine million dollar shortfall is for next fiscal year, 
you know, I, I, I don't understand your logic in, in, I mean, pulling this necessarily as a, a rabbit out of the hat. I mean, we, we could have put all, no, any number of scenarios forward from pay cuts to furloughs to tax rate increases. Yeah. Uh, before, so I mean, I'm trying to understand how this. No, no, and I appreciate that. I'll, I'll get back to serious. What I would think is, uh, we we have made no decisions yet. Uh, in fact, we've had very little input. We've been I've been trying to get it over to maybe through audit and finance to hash some of these things out. But here's a pretty good, darn good plan. I, 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 I applaud you. And maybe uh, before decision making time, we could say, hey, we've got some a little bit of hurdles, but we've got a pretty good plan to do that. We rolled it out as an eight to nine million dollar hit, and it looked bad. After all these wonderful wins on the scoreboard, it was like a stumble a little bit in my perspective. Oh my gosh, eight to nine million dollars. Well, in reality, we just took care of five point eight million dollars in a snap. So, just a perspective. Well, is, is this a plan or is it an idea? Because you know, I, I have some doubts about eight hundred thousand dollars in new construction activity actually occurring. I have still some questions about the employee benefit trust that we might want to. Think about using that fund. You know, if we are anticipating increases in the future, is this the best time to do three and a half million dollars? And the adjusted water rate increase. Just watching Catherine Sorensen fidget, I want some more information on that. You know, so is this, an, is this an idea or is this a plan? Right. And you know, remember, and, the snapshot we gave you was back in February, right, right. based on information that was the end of the calendar year. So we were trying to, and we're trying to make projections to begin in July one of 2012 or 2013 so mm -hmm. you'll have to yeah there is a lot of information that keeps coming to us during this time and we're trying to and we shared with council during that time that we were going to look at employee trust fund as an opportunity we rec we thought that there may be an opportunity there we hadn't identified the value we talked about i think other activities like construction activity yeah at the time the water fee was not that was new that came up in a discussion well, if, if I could stop you, I mean, the, the eight to nine million dollars was the was a snapshot at that time. Right. That was that was, if not reality, it was certainly perceived reality. Now, how we took care of that is really a separate question that I think. Well, what, this what, is fiscal year fourteen. This is for next mm -hmm. year. Right, this is not 13. for yeah. ending this fiscal year. Correct. Correct. This fiscal year, we're ending on budget. Right. Correct. Yeah, correct. Okay, so this, yeah, this is, this all is moving forward. Into next That's what I'm year. saying. So th that was leading off the budget discussion with the resources that we had at the time. Mm -hmm. We anticipated a nine million dollar shortfall for oh, 13, okay. 14. That yeah. and that's what I'm for saying. That, that and that was the perception. That, okay, as we're going forward, this is where we have to look. Now we're going to come up with ideas of how to deal with that. It's not like we spent all the money in the checkbook and we're learning where to get the money to make payments right. for the next. Well, that, and that's why I, I don't like that's, words like shortfall because mm -hmm. people. Government deals with budgets and then reality. And unfortunately, we talk about shortfalls, and they're really budget shortfalls. And the estimated shortfalls. It's it's a, well, that even makes it right. Estimated, estimated budget shortfalls. shortfalls. Correct. Now, when people hear that, what they're thinking, if I have a shortfall in my, in my personal finances, that means I don't have enough money to pay my mortgage. That's a shortfall. That's not what we're talking about. No. We're saying we estimate next year we'll have $100. Now we look at the information we have, and golly, we think we may only end up with $91. Well, that's a big difference than, oh, good crud, we're, we're here at payday and we can't make it. And so I, you know, I, I think sometimes, I don't want to get it overblown because you, you still have to match what reality might be. But to me, you said what you thought, if we move ahead and based on our budget projections, we're going to see basically a, less revenue than what we what we thought and higher costs, which is going to create a situation, a gap we got to plug, going forward. Let's come up with some ideas how we might plug that gap. And here's a first shot of some ideas. Is that a that's accurate correct, way to describe Mayor. that? That's that's correct, Mayor. When we're coming to okay. you at, in the beginning, we're coming to you with an estimated of where we think we're going to be, not just for next year, but really we look out eight years. And, uh, when we're right, and we'll have sure we'll have to decide what that fix. We can't change that eight to nine million dollars. That's not a policy decision. That, that's a number that's, that, that, that that's may correct. turn into reality. That's correct. What we can decide as a council, from a policy standpoint, is what what specific actions are we going to ad, uh, adopt, whether whether suggested by you or on our own, mm -hmm. to plug that gap. And what you're saying is that what this is, this is the first shot, as you're suggesting how we might plug that gap. <clears throat> Vice Mayor? Well, this is wonderful, and I appreciate Councilmember Ritson's way. I guess it goes to tone and tenor. Mm -hmm. You know, 
the tone was ominous. It has had a chilling effect through the city, morale, other things. And so <clears throat> the second sentence I would put in there, we anticipate eight to nine million dollars of challenges, things that we need to look at. But we also, and I think there were some of these pieces in people's heads as a possibility. So maybe a second sentence is, but we're working hard and we think we got some great ideas to, to make it up. I guess it would just be about delivery more than anything. So that's that's yeah. kind of, and I do realize lots of decisions yeah, I mean, coming. Uh, tone and tenor starts with me. Tone and tenor starts with you. Yeah. You know, so when we take a tone like we do in meetings like this, we've got to be really careful about that because tone and tenor starts with the council and the mayor. Yeah. And so we need to be the ones showing the leadership from the get-go. I, I, I just remember back, and, uh, you know, someone asked me, what, what, what are you going to do with that? And I said, listen, I, I, we all were in office five weeks. When Chuck and Chris walked into my office and said, hey, we're $65 million short. Now, this is watching the previous council really, really struggle with a $20 million. And we're, and we're looking at $65 million, and guess what? You're not, you're not getting better. It's getting worse. Uh, I mean, I know that, that you know, the, the, the fat, we're now down to the bone on a lot of these things. And, and sometimes a $9 million, uh, a $9 million number is, is a bigger challenge than a 60, 65. But I have complete confidence. We figured out a way to deal with that. We'll figure out a way to deal with this one. And I appreciate the, the start. Uh, and the suggestions that give us, uh, um, you know, some some news that you know we, we can manage through this. I, I'm confident we can do that. I, it may not be easy, it may not be fun, but we'll get there. Is that okay, Tom? All right. <laughs> oh, if looks could kill. So, <laughs> Mayor, we don't need to spend a lot of time on the next slide. It's I know the Audit and Finance Committee has asked us to look at the transfer. We just wanted to identify other. Um, resources that may be out there. Obviously, there, it doesn't include, which we need to look at, is continued savings uh, within the departments. But we just wanted to know that this is an area that I think we, we've been asked to look at this. I think uh, the transfer, uh, we mentioned there's, we've used the secondary property tax rate in the sense of being able to um, pay down uh, capital uh, with that. So these are just some other options that we may want to consider going forward. Yeah, and I see increase, 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 and I want to get Speaking of headlines, that's not a great headline, increase, increase, increase. Uh, I think when we look at enterprise fund transfers, for example, uh, we need to put that in context and realize, I think, what are we going on, six, seven, eight years with the same, mm -hmm. when was that implemented? That's, that's about right. right. A couple of years open. before we bought it. 08, 09. 09. 09, so this will be the sixth year. Of, well, the, of the same. 09, the budget 09 couldn't have been because it was before we well, came into it office. Was, It'd be like no, it was 07, 07 or it was 07. 07 08. Six, somewhere in there, yeah. So yeah, we're in this, this will be the seventh or eighth year that we have not changed that uh, increase. Last year we didn't, uh, we kept utility rates frozen basically across the board. Uh, and so, you know, I think, I hope that as we go through this, we keep things in context too. We, I, I believe we've done a very good job of managing an incredibly difficult situation and we'll adjust. and. Uh, you know, I guess we could have changed uh, that transfer a couple years ago and eased, and eased, the, eased the, the problem and, and it may not have been a big deal. Well, now we may need to look at that tool. We, we could have changed the, uh, uh, could have changed utility rates, but we didn't. Uh, we, we, we respected the situation our, our rate payers are in and we, we held those steady. So we didn't have to uh, uh, change the, uh, the enterprise fund. Uh, we look at the secondary property tax rate. We've talked from day one as to whether to apply that to a larger base, and that's what I'm assuming you're talking about, is no. is extend that onto debt that is currently paid out of uh, sales tax dollars. Right. Correct. It's paid out of the general. Uh, which is fund. legally authorized by. Yeah, we've done it. We've got, We've done it. We've used it to. And we've talked about it. We've talked about it a lot. The question is, and and that's we've also talked about how that's a temporary uh, fix. But once again, I think when we looked at this five years ago, everybody, not only us, but mm -hmm. if someone would have told you that going into 13, 14. We would now be talking about recovery happening in 15, 16, or 16, 17. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody would have would have bought into that because this recession has lasted longer, or this recovery has been delayed longer than anyone in our history, in our lifetime, certainly. Uh, and with me, that's a long time. And with Dennis, it's even longer. Uh, <laughs> but you know, we're in we're in uncharted territory now because everybody, I think, at least hoped that we would see some real economic growth by this time, and we haven't. Uh, we've seen some, we've seen some some small little mm -hmm. successes like the home building and that, but we're just not there yet. Councilor Richens. Yeah, just a comment about the environmental compliance fee rate. That the whole idea behind that was to cover unfunded mandates from 
environmental mandates from the state and federal governments. Are we seeing anything happening in the legislature or at the federal level that would we'd want to address? Yeah. There's some that there's some items and there's some increased again. costs that we're gonna, we're pull, pulling together right now. To yeah, we're working these. on those right now with the departments. We are hearing about some increased costs. We just haven't had the time to pull all that together okay. into a comprehensive manner. So okay. we'll be coming back with that. Because we're going to evaluate that for right. a year over a year based on Correct. what is, those expenses were right. for the city. That's why we're going to bring that to you. Very good. Thank you. Make sure we're made whole on those. Okay. All righty. Any other questions? Thanks, Candace. Okay. So, Mayor, if you could, I think what we should uh, recommend was we move to the transit services budget presentation. Uh, Let's there's do some that. items we need to okay. bring up today. Transit services. Ms. Sorrell, I think that's yours. Good evening. Um, I'm just here to give you a quick update on the transit services budget for next fiscal year. And I do need your direction on a couple items as we go through this budget presentation. So let's to start with um, just a quick update. Last year, one of the items we came to you as an innovation was with the unification or the new delivery method for the East Valley Dollar Ride service. Um, that began on July 1st as a pilot program, a first year pilot program. Um, it's resulted in some significant savings to the general fund contribution to dial ride It's we've estimated about $1.3 million of over what we paid last year for dial ride services. That has already been accounted for in our forecasting for the next year. Um, but prior, just to give you an idea, in fiscal year 11-12, um, we paid about $1.5 million for dial ride service. So we've seen a significant decrease in that. The service is um, providing some good customer service. The, the customers um, are appreciative of it because it's no more, no longer a shared ride service. It's a direct brokerage service. It's a one seat trip for them. Um, the ridership is on, on mark to kind of hit fiscal year 12, if not exceed it. We've seen our average trip length decrease a little bit, but the important thing is we've seen our cost per trip go down from $33.39 a trip to $25.71 a trip. So that's about $7.68 per trip savings for our dial ride Along with our dial ride service, we also offer our ADA certified customers a platinum pass, which is as an employee, we get those platinum passes to ride on bus and rail. Um, the trips are costing us a dollar to 85 cents a trip. So if one person takes the platinum pass, uses two trips um, on train or bus per month, that pays for it in itself from the city as opposed to them taking a dollar ride trip. Last year, we implemented the East Mesa Circulator, which was our bus route um, along Baseline and Signal Butte and Southern and the East Valley. It was designed to hit the major um, tax generators and some of the um, senior living and, and residential communities out in that area. Um, as you can see, ridership has um, steadily increased from month to month. Um, it's it, November hit an all-time high of 4,500 4, riders a month, and um, most riders in our survey data they're riding the route about four to six days a week. Um, most of them are using it to connect to the regional service at Superstition Springs Transit Center. Uh, so our recommendation for this route is to continue it as the seasonal circulator for fiscal year 14 continue to operate it in the counterclockwise direction um, that it currently operates. And that's a budget impact of about $335,000. We also talked about a transit advertising program. That, um, that program is a little bit more complicated to put together than we had anticipated. So um, we are continuing to look at three evaluations, three options for implementing it, and we'll come back to you with that. In the meantime, the planning department has modified the sign code language and that's ready to go. So we hope to come back in the next next few months with, with the plan for the advertising program. Um, the next now, this next fiscal year, we're gonna see um, some continued savings in our fixed route service. Tempe, the city of Tempe is now going to purchase the operating operations part of their bus service from Valley Metro. So the whole East Valley will be unified under one operations contract. Um, for that, for the cities in the East Valley, that includes a decrease that will save us money because we'll have a decrease in our non-revenue 
operating hours, they're gonna move routes over to the Tempe facility to cut down on what's called deadhead time, the travel time from the facility to the um, where it starts. Um, streamline and management staffing, no longer duplication of general managers at each place, so we'll save money there. And just economies and scale and ordering parts for maintenance and so forth. Now for Mesa, we'll see a savings. Most of our savings will be in the general fund area since the majority of our, our will be in the Proposition 400 PTF fund area since most of our routes are, about two thirds of our routes are funded by Proposition 400. Um, with the savings, we've received some requests from the city of Chandler. They would like to add some runs to certain routes. Um, in order to do that, we need to extend the routes anywhere from one to two miles to allow them to do that. So that's something we're gonna be evaluating as we move forward with this savings that we're you seeing to see how, how we wanna prioritize adding that service back in with all the cuts that we made in 2009. Okay, this is one of the areas where I need um, some direction from the council. Um, Mesa has two dial-a-ride options currently. We have what's ADA dial-a-ride, and it's offered to disa the, our disabled community and seniors over 65. You must be ADA certified. It's available citywide. This service is offered, well, that's a typo, I'm sorry, offered Monday through Saturday. <laughs> it's only offered two days a week. Um, <laughs> And the fare for ADA service is $4 per trip. Non-ADA service is pretty much the exact same service offered on Sundays and holidays. And its fare structure is not the same as ADA. You pay a dollar for a base fare, which is a zone of a four mile square zone, and then 50 cents for each zone after that. And the non-ADA service is supplemental. It's not um, required as part of ADA. It's a carryover from um, years ago when we went to ADA certified only for dial -a ride the non-ADA was kept as a way for other residents to travel into Mesa to shop, go to church, go to the doctors, or whatever they needed to do. With our new service delivery method, that, um, that non-ADA service is not really applicable anymore, cause, and it's, it hasn't been for a while, because either way you need to be ADA certified. I know it's very confusing. <laughs> So what we'd like to recommend is eliminate the non-ADA service and replace that with the ADA service. You're really replacing the rate structure. We're re yeah, we're replacing the, the rate structure. Yeah, the service mean, stays this is the same. an evolution of decisions that took place when ADA, we had to make that distinction because well, ADA when, was a specific term. But when you replace that, uh, I would assume the service would be offered on every day of the week except for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. <laughs> that would be correct. Yeah, no. oh, okay. What we'd so, do is we'd... <laughs> We'd offer it seven, it would be, we'd essentially be offering ADA service seven days a week. All right. Citywide, just and, like and, the same and, rate. And at, at the, 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 the $4, $4 rate. So yes. it wouldn't matter which day of the week you're That's, going. Okay. Right? It'd be right. the same. It'd be right. the same. Okay. Um, and the reason this is important is uh, Valley Metro is going to start raising the non ADA fare. So eventually that fare will be higher than the ADA fare. Okay, you got a lot of slides here. What do you what do you recommend? I'm recommending that we eliminate the non-ADA service and replace it with ADA service. Okay. And that sounds like we're eliminating a service, but we're not. We're not. We'll still no. have bus service. Rather right. than say eliminate, we the would rate. say that we rate. that we Change choose to exclusively use utilize the ADA dollar ride rate and yes. service model. Okay. We're not eliminating service. We're not eliminating. We're exclusively using the ADA dollar there ride service. As opposed to line. two separate programs, we are exclusively going with one program. Yes. Uniform. There you program. go. Uniform. That's good. That's good. All right. Okay. So is, you need to go over the, all the other next slides that give you the reason why that. No, I do need to talk about mileage reimbursement. Program. Okay. Are there any questions related to that that recommendation? Support. Okay. Okay. And go to where you need to go to on mileage reimbursement. The mileage reimbursement program is part of our ride choice program. Um, we offer a couple different options to use to offset our dial ride costs. This program has been administered by um, Valley Metro, and they've told us that beginning July 1, 2013, um, they're no longer going to administer this program because it's unique to Mesa. Um, so we have- Is it a better program than the other one? Is it a better program? It's- yeah. um, So how come the others aren't- Coupons for cabs or dial ride? How come the other ones aren't looking- it was just, Again, this is one of those programs kind of left over. And something we've done before. before. Well, it's okay. um, we we offer three ride choice options for our ADA customers to take advantage of, as opposed to dial a ride. One option on Mondays, the other ones on no. Tuesday, Wednesday, no, and the third one. No, this is seven one. days oh, a week okay. as well. 
One is where you can get, um, one is a medical, um, reoccurring medical trip where you can take a cab for a dialysis and not have to gotcha. um, go through the dial ride. The other one is coupons for cabs where you get coupon vouchers at a cheaper rate and where they're subsidized. This program allows the participant to use a non-resident in that house to be reimbursed mileage they take them to go on trips, medical trips oh, okay. or errands. Gotcha. Uh, this is uniformity again yeah. for the yes. reason. Okay, Councilman Kavanaugh. Well, I have to be sentimental since this is my program. Oh, no. It goes back, <laughs> goes back more decades, and we were unique in doing it and won national attention for the creative way of having the mileage reimbursement. But I understand where staff is coming from, but I still have a tear <laughs> to, uh, to lose it. You have been eliminated. <laughs> so that if we um, want to move ahead with uniformity with the region, we'd ha we would um, eliminate this program. May, May would be the last month that we would offer the program to allow Well, if we did not, checks. would we have to take over? We if would we have to take not, over the city would have, would have to do it. Then. We would have to take over um, yes. cutting the checks cutting and, and doing check. all of that. All righty. OK. Um, and then finally, it's the um, this is the transit service budget for next fiscal year. And it shows the reflection of the re reduction in the dollar ride costs in there. I, I'm a little confused. It shows the reduction. It shows um, from the 12-13 budget to the 13-14 proposed. What's the 12-13 year end estimate, which is substantially less than the 12-13 budget? Yes. Um, that is because right now, one of the challenges we have um, with our fixed route contract is we get it early and okay. Valley Metro um, adds, I guess, contingency for the mileage costs and then they adjust it mid-year. So for this particular fiscal year, last year when we did the, um, our agreement for bus service, they estimated at $6.61 a mile. And in December, that was adjusted to six dollars and nineteen cents. Gotcha. Let me let me ask you a question. Uh, we we had an estimate, a budget of ten million dollars, and because of the changes during the year, we came at seven point one million. As we're going forward and and, and getting back to this nine million dollars, uh, so you the, saw the the numbers we carried over. Are those based on the budget amount from this so year. So the or second that you saw on the se our second slide, on this, we had, we had identified about one point three million dollars early on. And we've already included in the okay, forecast. So, so that's we've, already we've included. included this in the forecast yeah. that you saw back in February. This okay, was already so that's one point three. So that would from that and that goes off the ten. So that takes down to eight point seven. So we're still looking at this uh, perhaps being no more than the eight point seven that that we had uh, estimated. Does that make sense? Yeah, your I don't budget, know. Your budget, your budget was ten. Was, we had yeah, estimated was, with one point three. We we've already counted this before we came to you in February. This was an anticipated savings for this fiscal year. So we budgeted at the $10 million, but we anticipated the year-end yeah. estimate if, before we did the came to you in So I guess the question is, is am I looking at a $1.4 $1 million increase in the budget next year over what was actual, or am I looking at actually about a level amount of spending or even a slight reduction in spending? I'm look, you're looking at the 12-13 year-end estimate compared to the 13-14 proposed. Those are the two numbers that so you what's the be question is, what, what, what is the 8.4? Is that... Versus the 7.1. Why did it go back? Why did it go up from the? Why did it go up from the 7.1? What happened was, um, is the mile when we get our estimates from Valley Metro, they estimate um, a per mile cost, and that per mile cost, mm -hmm. even since we've done this, has fluctuated, but it's still within our budget. So, what they do is they give us an estimate of a per mile cost for a fixed route because that's our biggest um, service option. Halfway through the year, they readjust that cost based on fuel prices and different facilities. So this 8.5 million that you're looking at is based on, on their best, Valley Metro. Their for best next estimate year. for next so year. So that's almost like the 10, yeah. the 10 million is probably a, a not a best estimate, but a worst case. And then we'll scenario. come and adjust that like we did gotcha. this year. Right. Okay, I understand it. All righty, thank you. So we're good with the mileage reimbursement and the. Yeah. Okay. I think so. Yep. <clears throat> Which one would you like to um, library, library or please. library? Ms. Heather. They're trying to bribe me with my vote. They put in my picture in their stuff. Oh. That's.
Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Heather Wolf. I'm the Library Director. Um, beside me running the PowerPoint here today is Don Kusrak, our Management Assistant too. Um, we're here today to talk to you about the fiscal year 13-14 budget, but we would like to start by giving you an update on our fiscal 12-13 innovations. Um, you may remember that last year about this time we came and talked to you about a plan to increase hours at all of our locations. We implemented a new schedule. We were now open Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. and Friday and Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. That increased our overall hours to 216 per week. And in addition, we also opened to the public at 9 a.m. for a self-service hour which added another 20 hours to our weekly operations, increasing our hours by about 40%. We started those in May 14, 2012, and they've been a great success. Um, at the time, we also proposed a collaborative workspace, makerspace, and digital media lab. At the time, we were calling it the iMesa Links program um, because it was based on an iMesa suggestion. Um, we've now changed the name to ThinkSpot and I'm very excited to say that we completed construction. There's a picture here um, from our final walkthrough at the very end of March. We've hired a coordinator who started today and we have lots of work for her. Um, it'll be her job to furnish and equip the room, provide programs, and engage the business and education communities to help <coughs> us program that space. We also um, received some funding to update the Dobson Library. As you may remember, it's 25 years old and the furnishings have not been updated in that time. Um, staff thought we knew what we needed to do with that money, but we did check with the community first. Um, we had over 950 um, surveys returned to us. Um, they were completed by <coughs> current library users, former library users, and people who had never used the Dobson Library um, because Councilmember Kavanaugh really helped us get the word out and get um, a variety of people um, submitting those surveys to us. Um, we learned some things. Um, and so we've analyzed all that information. We've prioritized the requested improvements. And we're going to start by addressing the noise issue, which we did not realize was as bad as it was. Um, we had a lot of complaints. Um, people really want some quiet space in the library. Um, future note, concrete walls, beams, posts, <laughs> and vaulted ceilings made of metal don't work so well in a library. So um, we're going to be addressing um, the noise issue. Um, also the need for a restroom that does not require people to go outside to use it. Um, that was the second biggest complaint. Um, and then seating. And the last time I was at the library was in the afternoon and I could see why that was the third complaint. Um, there was not a spot to be had. Every table, chair, um, had somebody sitting in it, either using the computers, using their own laptops, reading books, reading magazines, interacting with each other. It was wonderful, but it was crowded. So we need to figure out ways to find more space for that. We are working with an architect to master plan the space, and uh, we hope to have that started real soon. All right. For fiscal year 13-14, we're not actually asking for additional funds, but we do want to um, pilot several innovations. The first innovation that we're looking at is um, something called an embedded librarian. It's a term we're borrowing from the academic library world. Um, if you think of how journalists would embed, um, say, with troops during uh, a war, that's kind of the idea, is, is that you liaison so closely with a particular community that you're embedded. Um, you become one of that community. Um, our plan is to start with two communities. We already have one librarian who has been attending Chamber of Commerce meetings on a regular basis. It gives this person a chance to find out what the business community is looking for, to remind them that the library often has those tools and resources for them. And um, we've also ended up with several programs because we have local experts out there who can come to the library and 
offer programs on their subject matter. So we're looking at doing that um, in greater in depth with the business community. And then we'd also like to have a librarian liaison with the downtown universities, the higher education um, facilities around Mesa. And we think that'll be a great um, way to bring the library to them and bring um, them to the library. Our next project is an offshoot of the Dobson Library update. Um, we are finding that there is very limited square footage for all of the competing needs. And if we can significantly reduce the customer service desk, um, that gives us an opportunity to create more seating space, more room for computers, more room for new books. So we are going to untether the staff. Um, we are going to give them tablets and headsets. Um, our new phones do work with Bluetooth and we will have the staff roaming or mobile um, throughout the space so they can answer the phone, um, help people where people are at instead of forcing them to come up to the desk. And we're very excited about this. It's a very innovative pro project. Our final pilot project is a digital help desk at the main library. Um, if you can come up with a better name, we'd love it, <laughs> the help. Um, currently, we provide a lot of hands-on instruction. People bring us their e-readers, their smartphones, um, their tablets, their laptops, and they're trying to download um, materials from our um, Freegal service or from our digital um, library service, and they need help. So all of our staff have been trained to a certain core level of competency, but we have people who need a lot more help. Um, we had one gentleman who recently used um, the Dobson Library, the main library, over the course of several days and several different staff members to finally get to what he was trying to do. What we would love to have is a desk where we can say this many hours a week, say one to five, Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, you can go to this place and get that level of hands-on, side-by-side instruction so that people can use the wonderful resources that we have and we pay a lot of money for um, to be able to download um, all the digital services that we have. Okay, all right. This is our budget slide. They told me I had to put numbers in here somewhere, so here they are. Um, as you can see, our fiscal year 13-14 budget does show a slight decrease from this fiscal year's adopted budget. Um, there are two reasons for that. The first reason being that our innovations with impact that we are um, working on this year were one-time monies, so those monies are not there for next year. Also, you can see that our personal services line has decreased by about $100,000. We've been working very hard in the library as positions become open to um, examine them and decide what that job really should be. And as a result, we have taken some higher level positions and turned them into lower level positions, saving money that way. Is there any questions about that? Um, the final part of the presentation is really kind of talking about the future. Um, when we were meeting with the city manager and the budget office, we spent a lot of time talking about what does the 21st century library look like, what kinds of services does it offer, um, and how are we positioning ourselves to deliver those services. Um, as you can see from this map, it's just a little reminder of where our current libraries are located. Um, while libraries are transitioning um, and things are changing greatly, our core service of providing access to information does not change and people still come to the library for that purpose and for many other purposes and we still need physical library buildings. So the next slide and I apologize for the small scale here. This is a map of where all of our library card holders reside. And as you can see, Mesa Public Library um, serves people from all over the county. Um, we have people 
and Buckeye and I think that's probably Anthem here way up at the top who use our library for whatever reason. I don't know if they work here, they go to school nearby. Um, for whatever reason, they've gotten a library card from us. But obviously, the majority of our users are located in the Southeast Valley um, with the highest concentrations around the Dobson Library and the main library, and then, of course, Red Mountain Library. So you can see that people do use the library that's closest to them. There is definitely a convenience factor for people getting a library card. Um, they want to use the library that's closest to them. Um, Heather, mm -hmm. that's where Kevin is. <clears throat> and, uh, this just brings to mind another issue that we've talked about throughout the years in terms of budget. I do know that I've been contacted by Councilmember Rick Human of Chandler, who wants to work with us as a city again in meeting with the new county supervisors to talk to them about the inequity in uh, funding for the uh, county regional library system as well at versus what we get in terms of allocations uh, for people who use our, our system. And the hope is with the past retirement of the, the county director and the new supervisors coming along that we can have some productive discussions to help with that inequity in term, and revenue flow that comes back. Um, for us, because it's clear that a lot of people use us, but the, uh, a lot of outflow goes to support uh, other libraries in, uh, in Maricopa County. Well, thank you, Councilmember Kavanaugh. We actually had a meeting today of um, the 13 municipal library directors and the Maricopa County Library District Director, where we talked about new models that could be used for reciprocal borrowing. Um, nothing's been decided yet, but the conversation has definitely started, so I appreciate your efforts. Um, so bottom line, uh, future needs. Uh, the, uh, a consultant prepared a report back in 2002 um, looking at where libraries should be located for Mesa Public Library because we do not have enough locations for our um, population at that time and we certainly don't have it for our current population. Um, in examining that work, um, we've updated the recommendation slightly and we're recommending um, that in the future there be uh, three additional library branches, um, one being located in the north central neighborhood um, around the area of Val Vista McKellips. All of these of course depend on available um, land. Um, Southeast neighborhood library around Ellsworth and Elliott and then an East Mesa neighborhood library around Charisman and Maine. Councilmember Richens. Do you envision these being full branch libraries or more on, along the model of the Mesa Express Library? The Mesa Express Library um, is working very well. It's very successful, but it is an express library. It's not a full service library. Um, recently, uh, Councilmember Summers had a Building Strong Neighborhoods event just a couple of weeks ago. Um, while library staff members were there, they had two separate people come up and ask if there was any way we could offer children's story times at the Express Library. They understand that it is an Express Library, but they still are looking for those additional services that a full service library offers. Um, we, it, it, to me, it's kind of like the um, grocery store. You know, you have a neighborhood convenience market on the corner, and then you have a full-service grocery store and those sorts of things. So the Express Library is serving a need. It's a great way to serve an area that has not had um, Mesa Public Library service, but it's not satisfying the full need. So Vice these Mayor. libraries would be f full service. No. Vice Mayor? <clears throat> I, had, I had questions along these lines, too. I'd seen, uh, I, I saw that we had a previous... Uh, a PowerPoint uh, that talked about 35,000 square foot uh, buildings and you guys have been so amazing with your innovation. I mean, we look at you as the example of the hardest hit through these tough recession times and, and bouncing back and doing amazing innovation, other things. And so I hope we don't lose that. Uh, you, you know, the express libraries were, uh, I, I think, a, a, a step in the right direction. Uh, I wouldn't pretend to know where uh, library service is going, but it, it you know, citing that um, study from 2002, I think things have changed. Um, you know, the medias, the uh, Kindles, you know, everything that everybody's using. We've used a model on aquatics where we've said, hey, regional system. So I, 
one thought as I looked at this, uh, the map of the, the library system, we have a pretty strong backbone uh, in the three major branches, and then we have that little express library. We have eSmart coming on, that's a major area that probably needs a major library. But asking people to drive a little bit farther, <clears throat> you know, taking on that uh, burden to meet a more regionally located hub seems like a pretty reasonable um, trade off versus putting a, a huge expense of a 35,000 square foot building and others. So I know it'll be, you know, things for future debate and. And again, appreciate what you're doing, but I'm hoping we don't lose some of that innovation going back to kind of the old system. So, just Vice Mayor Vendrick, um, if I can respond to that, um, obviously, we can't. We don't have the time to have a full discussion about, like I said, the 21st century library and what it is. Um, but the libraries that we're envisioning, yes, they do have a certain amount of physical square footage, but they don't look like the libraries of the past. Um, Libraries are a community space. Um, many people come to our libraries to check out books, um, but they also come to the library for programs. They come to use the computers. We do need to remember that while the digital stuff is growing at leaps and bounds, at this point in time, digital downloads count for 7% of our um, total circulation. We've been in the business of providing e-readers since 2000, and I don't think most people realize that. So we are on paying attention to technology. We are very much aware of what's going on, but we also have to balance the needs of our community. And we do have a lot of people who are left behind when it comes to digital products, and so they come to us to fill that need. Um, we have a lot of people using the Job Help Hub and the Career Center to apply for jobs online because when you don't have a job, you often don't have access to an internet-based com computer to apply for jobs and many, many job places only accept online applications. So that's one way that people are using our libraries now digitally and we still need the space for that. Um, we're looking at, um, we even talked with the city manager about a bookless library, but you still need space for programs, you still need space for meeting, you still need space for people to work together on projects, for school kids to come together. Um, there's a lot of things that you need that space for. Um, so what I would like to say is, is the 35,000 square feet, whether that's the final number or not, it won't look like our current facilities, I promise. Councilman Richards. Yeah, I was trying to, uh, as I was listening to you, I mean, and my feeling is that the library model of today is a dinosaur, and it's it's on its way out. It's not going to be like this. In 50 years, libraries that we recognize as libraries are going to totally change. Um, you know, so I'm curious about, and, and when we can get into a fuller discussion about it, uh, I'm sure in the future we'll have this opportunity. But, you know, I, I think about, you know, the 7%, that number is going to go up and up and up Absolutely. and up. And I'm interested in the demographic analysis of that. You know, what are the ages of the people that are still checking out books and reading the newspapers out there? And, and you know, I, I think I would venture to guess that it's a lot of the baby boomer generation is continuing to do that. And as these younger generations come, they're going to, they're going to, they access media, they access things far differently. There's always going to be a role for books. And I, I would, I love holding a book and reading a newspaper, you know, but, uh, you know, as, as, as our municipal finances evolve too, it's going to be really hard to support, you know, seven or eight branch libraries. But when you think about how nimble we could be with this model that we've developed, you know, and all the available retail space, you know, and you can, you can ebb and flow based on the changes in the neighborhood. You don't have to get tied down to any one location. There's a lot of opportunity there. And so given it as, I, I think like Vice Mayor Finter made a really great point about how innovative you guys are. So I encourage you, as you start think, thinking about your model going into the future, really innovate. Look at your demographics. Look at how they're changing in those demographics. And, and then what, you know, it's hard to predict the future, what it's going to look yeah. like. But try to innovate towards the future instead of, you know, thinking that your, your current model. So you guys are incredibly innovative. You do a great job. I think you could do a fine story time in, in your Mesa Express library. It's got plenty of space, been there, seen, seen it. They do a great job there. It's a, it's a really great model. Thank you. Thank you. Any okay. more questions? <laughs> Comments? Okay. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Appreciate it. And Mayor Council, I think we've probably run out of time. We have provided to you, I think uh, Council Member uh, Kavanaugh asked for the list of 
the items for Channel 11, which we provided to you. That is a, um, Steve, five-year, where'd they go? Five-year plan? Five-year plan. Five-year, so we've, We've included that for you, and we're trying, what we're doing is funding that in increments over the five years. But there, you have the list for you to see. They, they've gone through that exercise. We asked them to put that together so we can plan for the next five years um, equipment that will need to be replaced. So you have that for you. So I'm, I think that would be okay. covered our presentation. So. any questions you want to ask about that i tried to go through the presentation from the communications it was gibberish i couldn't understand it <laughs> <laughs> not really steve yeah um we'll Wait, do, no if you want i steve can you come up here and do it in like sure five minutes yeah i'd hate to give this one short shrift because this this presentation is about how we can be transparent to constituents Okay. But this, this this piece is is our, how we communicate with the world. I don't want to jam this into ten minutes. Well, the other thing is is that you know as Heather was talking about the library of the 21st century, our way of communicate communicating has changed considerably. Yeah, uh, and will continue to change. Yeah, I mean it'd be a shame to not have a full opportunity to okay. have this conversation. So so you're asking rather, me to reschedule? I'd rather adjourn. Yeah, re okay. reschedule. You want to reschedule it? Okay. Um, Thank you. You were, you were very enlightening. Thank you. <laughs> I, I like to be pithy. The, we don't want to give him time on his own TV station, right? <laughs> um, I was going to say before you spoke, that was the most intelligent thing I'd heard from you today, but then you spoke. <laughs> What's with the groans? I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Okay. Um, next item is acknowledge receipt of uh, minutes of uh, boards and committees have a motion for Councilman Cavanaugh, a second Councilman Glover. All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Here reports and meetings, conferences attended. Do we have anything? Councilman Cavanaugh. Uh, just a brief report. Uh, Saturday I attended a celebration on Dobson Ranch that was recognizing its uh, 40th anniversary. Uh, we had uh, Ann, Ann Patterson there, whose uh, parents lived in a farmhouse at uh, Alma School and Baseline. And, was able to talk about uh, her family's uh, ranching and farming activities in that area to a disbelieving audience that uh, didn't realize that farming and ranching and cattle took place there and all the things that uh, her family did in terms of donating land for Banner Desert Hospital. And it was uh, wonderful to recognize her and uh, to celebrate uh, 40 years of a great community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Glover. This week is National Telecommunicators Week, and I had the opportunity to go to the dispatch center this morning and see all the public safety dispatch uh, workers. I want to thank them for the hard work that they do and because they do an excellent job at helping communicate with our residents when they're in dire need. And I want to invite the rest of the council to go by and stop by if they have time. Thank you. Um, anything else? I'd like to give out a um, congratulations to all those who were involved with the uh, Grand Prix swimming. I uh, didn't have a chance to get by, but boy, read the accolades that were uh, coming out of what a great event it was, what a great, beautiful facility it was, and uh, everything seemed to work out really well. The weather cooperated, everything, so uh, the Mesa Swim and, and our Parks and Recs and all those people who were involved uh, with that uh, event, uh, congratulations. It was really good, really good uh, to see those, those kind of things uh, um, come off and, and really be uh, wildly successful. So thank you. Mr. Brady. Yes, a reminder, um, I'll mention this again on Thursday, but this Saturday we have Celebrate Mesa. It's a free um, event at Pioneer Park, um, Saturday, April 20th from 3 to 6. I invite everybody out. A uh, lot of uh, fun, music, and food, bounce houses, and much more. So we invite everybody to come out to the park. And also um, on Saturday from 8 to noon, we have our hazardous waste collection event. This one will be at the one at North Center. So it's a free event, so bring your old paint, motor oil, and electronics to dispose of. Bounce houses at that one too? Probably wouldn't be a good combination oh. with the old paint. Certainly be memorable. <laughs> yes, but. Okay. There's nothing else. We have a motion to adjourn from the Vice Mayor, Seven Councilmember Glover. All in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Mm -hmm.